Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth installment of a multi-part series hosted by Bon Shenkin King in collaboration with the New York State Office of Medicaid Inspector General, also known as OMEG. Um, each of the prior webinars on this multi-part series are available on the Bond website, which is bsk.com. But moving to this installment, um, as you all are likely aware, the OMIG has been in the process of conducting reviews of compliance programs since the updated Part 521 regulations took effect. And today's installment will focus on common findings and lessons learned from those reviews. Today, we are lucky to have with us speakers um, from the OMIG, including Kathy Watras, who is the Director of OMIG's Bureau of Compliance. And we also have with us Caitlin Halpin, who is a supervisor within OMIG's Compliance Review Unit. We had another speaker scheduled from the OMIG, but unfortunately they're unavailable today. Um, today's program will close with a Q&A session, which is gonna be moderated by bond attorney, Gabe Oberfield. Um, we've received many questions in advance and we will answer those questions at that time. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, please enter them in the chat and we will uh, get to those during the Q&A session. Any questions that are entered into the chat that we don't answer live, uh, we will circulate with the OMEG and then share their responses after the presentation is concluded. Um, we will also be recording this webinar and sharing the recording with all of you afterwards as well. Um, and this webinar will be available on the Bond website, bsk.com, in addition to each of the previous intera iterations. And with that, I will turn it over to Kathy Watras. Good morning. Thank you, Jackson. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, welcome, we're glad you're here. And um, we're excited to share some compliance program information with everyone. Uh, we, um, last time we spoke, we focused uh, primarily on the changes in the regulation and what all those requirements were. This time we're gonna focus a little bit more on what we're seeing with reviews. Um, before I begin, I wanna take a, the chance to thank the folks at Bond and Jonathan King for inviting us to do this presentation. All right. Today we'll cover information about the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General uh, information about Part 521, OMIG's compliance program review process, common findings that includes common findings and best practices, and some of our resources. And like, like Jackson said, we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. So following is some information about the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General. OMIG's mission is to enhance the integrity of the Medicaid program while providing high quality patient care for all recipients. Let's talk about part 521. Amendments were adopted on December 28, 2022 and include requirements for compliance programs, managed care organizations and self-disclosure requirements. Outcomes of the amendments, <clears throat> excuse me, to the regulation include recognizing the key role providers play in program integrity efforts, <clears throat> building on existing longstanding provider compliance and reporting requirements, and aligning state and federal provisions related to compliance program requirements. Compliance program requirements, sorry, compliance program reviews began last July, and there are three look back periods that we've begun with. So we started with April through June, then we went out to July through September, and then October through December. So we've got three different review periods we're out there working with providers on. Today, we have completed 13 compliance program reviews and 88 are in various stages of completion at this time. Okay, we need to cover some definitions before we get going. All affected individuals is defined as all persons who are affected by the required provider's risk areas, including the provider's employees, the chief executive and senior administrators, managers, governing body and corporate officers, and contractors, agents, subcontractors, and independent contractors. 
For the remainder of the presentation, we'll refer to contractors, agents, subcontractors, and independent contractors collectively as contractors. Contractors are only subject to a required provider's compliance program to the extent that it's related to the contracted role and responsibilities within the provider's identified risk areas. For example, an entity contracted to provide credentialing services is required to comply with the written policies and procedures, training, and any other areas as it relates to the provision of those services. A contractor who is also a required provider can and should work with the providers it contracts with to determine how to implement the requirements of subpart 521-1 in the most effective manner. OMIG takes into consideration each provider's unique circumstances and characteristics when conducting its reviews. Providers should determine which contractors are affected individuals subject to their compliance program. Providers may need to modify existing contracts to enforce compliance by contractors. If a provider determines that a contractor is an affected individual, the contract should include required information regardless of whether the, it's created by the provider or the contractor. Doesn't matter who drafted that contract. Information required to be in contracts includes disciplinary standards for contractors and requirements for contractors to check exclusion lists. To assist providers in meeting this requirement, OMIG will only enforce this requirement for contracts newly executed or renewed from March, 2023 and no later than December, 2024. So we're kind of giving you a, 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 a grace period in which to make those changes to your contracts before we actually assess them. Providers should document their good faith efforts to modify existing contracts. Okay, let's get into compliance program requirements. Compliance program requirements in the new regulation include definitions, contracted requirements, sorry, contractual requirements, written policies and procedures, defined responsibilities, and that's, uh, for example, the compliance officer and the compliance committee, management level compliance committee, training requirements, and communications and transparency requirements. Additionally, we have auditing and monitoring requirements, which include auditing and monitoring risk areas, responding to compliance issues, and provider generated annual compliance program effectiveness review. And the regulation also requires reporting, returning, and explaining overpayments. OMIC considers, uh, you know, let me go back, I've got some additional information. OMI considers an effective compliance program to be one that at a minimum satisfies the compliance program requirements and is designed to be compatible with the provider's characteristics. In other words, their size, complexity, resources, and culture. For example, the compliance program should be well integrated into the company's operations and supported by the highest levels of the organization, including the chief executive, senior management, and the governing body. Promote adherence to the provider's legal and ethical obligations and be reasonably designed uh, and implemented to prevent, detect, and correct non-compliance with Medicaid program requirements, including fraud, waste, and abuse most likely to occur in the Medicaid program. Compliance programs should be reasonably designed, implemented, and enforced so that program, the program is generally effective in preventing, detecting, correcting fraud, waste, and abuse and non-compliance with Medicaid program requirements. The failure to prevent or detect an individual or unique compliance issue does not necessarily mean that the program isn't effective. In fact, that's what the program is designed to do, find those issues and correct them. The compliance program review module outlines all the necessary elements and requirements of an effective compliance program. The associate scoring system allows OMIC to review provider documentation received in response to the notification letter and evaluate whether the requirements were identified are observable in the documentation shared or upon subsequent interview. Okay, right, we'll get back into that process. OMIC's compliance program review process includes a notification letter to the provider for, okay, we're not working. There we go. Uh, a notification letter to the provider for commencement of a review and a review period in the past. The provider downloads the module from OMIC's website 
and submits a completed module within 30 days. We found that some providers don't fill out the module completely before submitting it. <clears throat> there are several sections within the module that are typically left incomplete. Uh, these sections include the provider's information. And at the top, there's an affected individuals table. We're looking to identify who your affected individuals are. So we have all the categories there that we generally know that are mentioned in, in the regulation, but you may not have all those types. So we just want you to identify what you do have. Okay, also module questions, sometimes they're left uh, unanswered. And then, then there's a documentation table at the end of the module. Uh, we wanna make sure that you're accurately identifying all the attachments that you're submitting to us in that list. If anything is left incomplete, we're gonna return that to the provider and ask them to complete it. We've also found that some providers don't submit all requested supporting documentation. If you don't have one or more pieces of the requested information, you should note that in the documentation at table at the end of the module. And just to clarify that, um, we give you lots of examples of the type of documentation that you may have, but that doesn't mean you don't have something else. So if you don't have, you know, generally what we're re referencing in the module or in our guidance documents, you may have something else. Just put that down and send that to us. And it's perfectly fine. OMIG reviews the completed module and documentation submitted by the provider. And we complete an assessment for each requirement based on the provider's answers in the module and the submitted documentation. At that point, we, we conduct a conference call with the provider to discuss any weaknesses that were observed. And the provider has an opportunity to submit additional documentation uh, if, if needed at that point. OMIG then notifies the provider of the results of the review. Uh, the scoring reflects the following. An average score is calculated for each month of the review period by counting the number of requirements that are met and then dividing by the number of accessible, accessible requirements. So we might start with 100 questions. There are some questions that may not apply to every provider, and those would be marked as not accessible. So each review really is a separate scoring function. Um, you may have 90 requirements that are accessible and therefore we would just score based on that. I'll give you an example. If there are 90 requirements that were met and there were 100 accessible requirements, the average score for that month or those months would be 90%. The monthly scores are averaged together to calculate the overall average score, which is the score we're talking about when we're saying if it was, uh, if you successfully passed the review or not. Um, so for example, for a three month review period, which is what we're doing right now, all monthly scores, in other words, let's say we have 80, 85%, 90% um, are added together and then divided by three, and that gives us the overall average score. This score is used to determine the provider's compliance program, whether the compliance program satisfactorily met all the requirements or not. <clears throat> a score of 60% or more will result in a satisfactory review, and a score of less than 60% will result in a non-satisfactory review. And turnaround time does vary uh, based on the provider's complexity, size, um, the amount of documentation that they submit. Um, so every re review is really truly different and take varying amounts of time. Let's discuss some best practices during a compliance program review. Once you receive a notification letter, you should assemble the appropriate team and begin working on the module and gathering your documentation. Compliance program reviews have a review period in the past, and so therefore most of the documentation should already exist. It's something you did in the past and it should already be there. There are a few instances where we ask for a summary, so that is something you might have to put together. Um, so, but again, don't delay because some of this documentation may take time to you know, go to the sources and find it and put it all together. Um, another best practice is to Communicate often um, with OMIG during the review process. We're here to answer your questions, to work you through that review. Um, and we really hope everyone is successful with that. Caitlin will now discuss some common findings and best practices for each element. Thank you, Kathy, and good afternoon, everyone. So before we start with element one, 
let's discuss a general finding that we've come across during compliance program reviews. Some providers choose to use pre-purchased compliance program materials, such as policies, templates, training materials, and so on, which can be used. However, providers should ensure that what they purchase includes all the required information. OMIC has found that this isn't always necessarily the case. If it does not include all the required information, then it's that provider's responsibility to supplement any in missing information by creating their own additional documentation. So for example, creating an addendum to include with the rest of the information. Another concern is that pre-purchase materials often lack content specific to that provider. So for example, pre-purchase compliance training materials may broadly state that the provider has lines of communication without identifying what they specifically are to that provider, which means that trainees may not know what specific phone number or email address, for example, to contact in the event they have a report to make or a question to ask. So if this is the case, providers should look for ways of including that sort of specific information along with their pre-purchase materials. Keep in mind also that pre-purchase materials may also contain outdated information or be specific to federal compliance program requirements instead of New York State compliance program requirements. While there is some overlap between the two, there are also requirements that don't overlap and would need to be added to the pre-purchase materials in order to meet New York State requirements. Purchasing a compliance program also doesn't address the actual implementation of the program, and the provider is responsible for implementing the policies they've purchased and then documenting that implementation. So moving on to element one, which is compliance policies. And I'll refer to written policies, procedures, and standards of conduct collectively as policies for the remainder of this presentation. And just to get the obvious out of the way up front, all policies must be in writing. Part 521 has requirements for certain topics and ethical obligations that must be included in a provider's policies. Policies should identify how the provider will implement them and outline the ongoing operation of the compliance program. So in other words, a compliance program is not just a one and done task, it's an ongoing operation and that should be outlined in the policies. So for an example, for a policy about monthly exclusion list checks, it could identify the individuals responsible for carrying out those checks, which exclusion lists they are required to check, by what date each month they are expected to complete their checks, how they'll document completion of their checks, and how they'll proceed if an affected individual is found on any of the exclusion lists. One area that we see providers struggle with is the applicability of written policies to all of their affected individuals. We often see providers using different terms throughout their written policies. So we recommend that providers define an umbrella term, and that could vary from provider to provider. Some examples could be the term all affected individuals or all personnel, just as a couple of examples. And then make sure that that definition includes all of the affected individuals for that provider. This way, that defined umbrella term can then be used consistently throughout the remainder of the policies so that they all apply to all of the providers affected individuals. Providers should also avoid using limiting language, or in other words, language that limits applicability of policies so that it only applies to some but not all categories of affected individuals. We often see that providers start out strong by defining an umbrella term, but then not using it consistently. So for example, in disciplinary policies, we often see providers using the term employees rather than all affected individuals or another synonymous term that that provider uses to mean all of their affected individuals. But by using the term employees, the policy does not address other categories of affected individuals, such as, for example, governing body members and contractors. A possible alternative to this could be for the provider to have a policy that discusses disciplinary policies for employees, 
contract language that defines disciplinary actions for a contractor if they are found, found to have violated the compliance program, and language in the governing body bylaws that defines disciplinary actions for governing body members if they violate the compliance program. So long as all categories of affected individuals have disciplinary standards for the compliance program that are applicable to them, this should be sufficient. Another area in which we see providers struggle is with the Deficit Reduction Act or DRA requirements. Providers are required to include detailed information in their policies about certain laws identified in the DRA, such as, for example, the federal and state uh, false claims acts, the federal administrative remedies, New York state law section 740 and 741, and so on. And if they have an employee handbook, that information must also be found there. Compliance program guidance addendum B on OMIG's website provides further information about DRA requirements. Again, a best practice is to define an umbrella term for all affected individuals, such as all personnel, representatives, associates, or all affected individuals, just to give a few more examples, and then use that defined term consistently throughout all your policies. Moving on to element two, element two discusses requirements for both the compliance officer and the compliance committee. So I'll start with those for the compliance officer before moving on to those for the compliance committee. The previous requirement for the compliance officer to be an employee of the provider has been removed. One area that we see providers struggle with is not having an annual compliance work plan, which outlines the provider's proposed strategy for meeting the requirements of 18 NYCRR section 521-1.4 with a specific emphasis on written policies, training and education, auditing and monitoring, and responding to compliance issues. A best practice for the annual compliance work plan is to identify who will perform the monitoring, the risk areas that are to be monitored, how the risk areas will be monitored, when the monitoring will be done, the date on which the monitoring was completed, results of the monitoring, plans of corrective action for any identified issues, and how the plans of correction will be checked for effectiveness. A best practice is to make the compliance work plan a living document. So examples of how to do that could be to include leaving space for the dates of completion and any sign-offs, as well as notes for status updates or any other important information. But that ability to come back to the work plan and update it with any information as needed is what makes it a living document. In addition to an annual assessment, another best practice is to complete an assessment whenever the compliance officer's duties change to determine whether non-compliance duties hinder the compliance officer in carrying out their primary responsibilities, which are identified in Part 521. So now that we've discussed the compliance officer, let's move on to the compliance committee. One area that we see providers struggle with is not having a compliance committee charter. The Compliance Committee Charter should include the responsibility to coordinate with the Compliance Officer, ensuring communication and cooperation by affected individuals on compliance-related issues, internal and external audits, or any other function or activity required by Subpart 521-1. Additionally, the Charter should include the responsibility to ensure that the Compliance Officer is allocated sufficient funding, resources, and staff in order to fully perform their responsibilities. And it's a best practice that providers set a supportive tone from the top culture to demonstrate their compliance program is well integrated into the company's operations and supported by the highest levels of the organization by ensuring that there is an active compliance committee. Moving on to element three, compliance program training. The term compliance is often used broadly, and often in the past when asked about compliance training, providers thought that in-service topics meant the requirement. But the regulation now identifies a list of specific topics that together make up the compliance program training, which I'll discuss in a minute. 
All affected individuals need to know that there is a compliance program and what their responsibilities are for the compliance program. Consequently, training and education for all affected individuals is a critical component for compliance programs to be effective. It's a best practice that compliance training as part of orientation for new affected individuals occur within 30 days of their start date. And then thereafter, that training should also be completed annually. Compliance training should be documented in an annual compliance training plan. And a detailed plan may demonstrate that providers have a training program that meets those requirements. The plan should be updated as trainings occur throughout the course of the year. Examples of how to make the compliance program training plan a living document include leaving spaces for the dates of completion, as well as also leaving spaces for any notes or status updates to also be added. But like the work plan, this ability to come back to the training plan to update it as needed is what makes it a living document. Also, make sure that your compliance training is in a form and format accessible to all affected individuals. So for example, if you have someone whose primary language is not English, offer your training in their preferred language so that they understand all the details of your compliance program and what their responsibilities are to the compliance program. Compliance program training may be customized for different types of affected individuals based upon specific issues for each type as long as all affected individuals meet the core training requirements of the Medicaid compliance program. Contractors should be made aware of the required provider's specific compliance program requirements and methods for reporting issues to the required provider's compliance officer. Contractors should also have an opportunity to ask questions about the compliance program. Providers may accomplish compliance program training for contractors by annually distributing a copy of the compliance program written policies that are applicable to such contractors, along with a letter or memo, including information related to each of the required topics. So for example, include identification of the provider's risk areas and organizational experience to the extent that those relate to the contractor's roles and responsibilities within the provider's risk areas. It's a best practice to include a dated distribution letter or to request that contractors complete an acknowledgement form demonstrating that compliance training has occurred. The regulation does not specify how the effectiveness of the training is to be periodically evaluated, so providers have some flexibility when determining how to do so. So some examples of methods could be the use of pre and post tests to determine growth of knowledge of the compliance program from before to after the training, identifying steps taken to address those who do not pass the tests, analyzing identified compliance issues and investigations to identify trends. So for example, is there any evidence to show that the lessons were applied in the workplace? Another method could be auditing incident logs and hotline reports to evaluate the effect compliance training has had on behavior. So for example, um, has there been an increase of reports of compliance program violations after the training has been given? Another method is using surveys to determine compliance knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions. So for example, do those trained feel that the compliance training was useful and sufficient? And if not, what plan of corrective action was implemented to resolve that? And another method could be conducting a knowledge survey several months after compliance training was completed to determine retention of that information. A common mistake is not including all the required training topics. So we recommend reviewing the topics identified in part 521 and including them in your compliance program training plan. Another concern is not training all of your affected individuals such as governing body members and contractors who sometimes get left out, we see. We also see providers include compliance training requirements in policies instead of a compliance program training plan that outlines the subjects or the topics for training, the timing and frequency of the training, which affected individuals are required to attend the training, how attendance is tracked, and how effectiveness of the training is evaluated. However, Part 521 requires these items to be included in a compliance training plan.
So let's talk about a best practice. A best practice is to use sign-in sheets for in-person training and acknowledgement forms for virtual training. Examples of other methods to document training has occurred include governing body meeting minutes that included such training and who attended, attendance logs showing when trainings occurred and who attended them, attestations signed by affected individuals saying that they received and understood the training, certificates of completion, and compliance training distribution letters to contractors. Element four is lines of communication. All lines of communication must ultimately go to the compliance officer, but there are methods such as hotlines that may not be directly overseen by the compliance officer. So for example, they could be answered by compliance personnel or contractors who then have the responsibility to send those reports directly on to the compliance officer. Confidentiality should be maintained regardless of whether a reporting individual requests it. Here are some frequently identified issues with regards to lines of communication. To start off, a common mistake we've seen is that providers confuse the term confidential and anonymous with each other. Confidential means that the reporter's identity is known, but maintained by appropriate compliance personnel. And appropriate compliance personnel can vary from provider to provider. So if a provider has a compliance officer and staff who report directly up to that compliance officer, then both the compliance officer and those staff members are considered appropriate compliance personnel. If a provider has only a compliance officer without staff that report up to them, then just the compliance officer would be considered appropriate compliance personnel. So that's confidential and anonymous means that the reporter's identity is unknown even by appropriate compliance personnel. So in other words, the reporter left their name off of the report altogether. Confidentiality should be maintained unless the matter is subject to a disciplinary proceeding referred to or under investigation by Mufuku, OMEG, or law enforcement, or if disclosure is required during a legal proceeding. It need not be the compliance officer who receives such communications and reports, but it must be the appropriate compliance personnel who have a responsibility to keep those communications confidential. Typically, the following methods of communication don't meet confidentiality requirements. This could be a hotline that may be answered by someone with no compliance responsibilities, or in other words, someone who is not considered an appropriate compliance personnel. A compliance email inbox that may be accessed by someone with no compliance responsibilities. And a data system that is programmed or accessed by staff other than appropriate compliance personnel. A common mistake is that providers don't make required information available on their website. If providers have a website, they should make information concerning the compliance program and the standards of conduct available on that site and make their affected individuals aware that this information is on their site. Let's move on to best practices. Ways that can be used to document website information during a particular time frame could be maintaining a log of what information is posted and when and where it was posted, maintaining screenshots of information on the website, including dates published, and maintaining documentation of how and when all affected individuals were notified that this information can be found on the website. Confidential methods of communication, such as a Dropbox, should be placed in an area with no monitoring and surveillance. So examples of an area with no surveillance could be um, a place without cameras pointing at it or a place without offices or desks nearby, meaning there aren't people around to see who's dropping something into the Dropbox. Element five is about disciplinary standards. Providers should demonstrate that they have established disciplinary standards and implemented procedures for the enforcement of such standards to address potential violations and encourage good faith participation in the compliance program by all affected individuals. When policies establishing disciplinary standards should be published uh, and disseminated to all affected individuals. Typically disciplinary action for governing body members is found in the bylaws and operating agreement 
and disciplinary action for contractors is found in the contract. As far as frequently identified issues, one that we found is not having disciplinary standards in place for all categories of affected individuals. A best practice is disciplinary actions should be progressive. So for example, beginning with a verbal warning all the way up to and including uh, the progress to termination, uh, depending on the severity of the violation or whether that individual has previously committed a violation of the compliance program. Element six is auditing and monitoring. And a provider should have systems for identifying compliance risk areas, routine auditing and monitoring, checking monthly for excluded providers, requiring contractors to comply with checking monthly for excluded providers, individuals, and companies. And to that end, OMIG looks for a good faith effort from providers to include this requirement in their contracts with their contractors. There should also be a system for the annual compliance program review. If the annual effectiveness review identifies areas not meeting the requirements, then a root cause analysis may help determine whether the deficiencies are due to insufficient staffing and resources for the compliance department. If the compliance officer has other duties, the provider should consider reducing such other duties or adding resources to the compliance department to assist the compliance officer in carrying out the day-to-day -day operation of the compliance program. As far as frequently identified issues go, providers not recognizing compliance issues is one of them. So to give some examples of what that could look like, uh, compliance issues could be found in certain risk areas like Medicaid billings and payments, including overpayments, ordered services, governance, mandatory reporting, and contract oversight. Providers not checking the exclusion status of all affected individuals at least every 30 days against the OMIG list of excluded individuals and the Human Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General's list of excluded individuals and entities, or LEIE list for short. A couple other frequently identified issues are providers not requiring contractors to check the exclusion list for all of their affected individuals, and providers not having documentation of the design, implementation, and results of any internal or external audits. Moving on to best practices, a couple of best practices could be uh, OMIG's recommendation that providers use the module and self-assessment form on OMIG's website in the compliance library to guide their annual compliance program review. By doing so, they're also preparing for how to respond to a notification letter for a compliance program review. So it, it almost makes the compliance program review an open book test in that way. The compliance work plan can help providers identify and evaluate risk areas in the compliance program that need to be monitored to determine whether plans of correct, corrective action are needed. And last but not least, element seven, responding to compliance issues. Providers should have systems for responding to compliance issues. These systems should include responding promptly to compliance issues when raised, in order to uh, correct the issue as soon as possible before giving it time to grow into an even bigger issue. Another system is investigating and correcting problems. And a common finding is that some providers have a system for investigating compliance program problems, but not one for correcting those problems. But both of them are needed in order to meet the requirement. Another system is ensuring compliance with state and federal laws, rules, regulations, and requirements of the Medicaid program. And providers should include a commitment to comply with those laws, rules, regulations, and requirements in their policies. And some frequently identified issues for element seven include that sometimes providers tell us that they don't have any reports of compliance issues, and therefore that must mean that their compliance program is working. However, this isn't always necessarily the case. So for example, we'd like you to consider the following questions. Do all affected individuals know how to report compliance issues and do they feel comfortable doing so? Are all lines of communication operational? Or in other words, is there a system in place for those lines of communication to be routinely checked to make sure they are functioning? 
and are all reports being documented and investigated. A best practice is monitoring corrective actions to ensure effectiveness. This means that after implementing a corrective action, the provider monitors and checks it to ensure it resolved the problem. If it hasn't resolved the problem, the provider should develop and implement another corrective action and then monitor and check that one to ensure resolution. Kathy will now discuss compliance program review sanctions and penalties in plans of correction. Thank you, Caitlin. According to Social Services Law Section 363B, if the provider does not have a satisfactory compliance program, the provider may be subject to sanctions and penalties permitted by federal and state laws, regulations, and including the revocation of the provider's agreement to participate in the Medicaid program. Only may impose penalties for failure to have an effective compliance program up to $5,000 per month in the first instance. Okay, so the first time we do a review, if it's not satisfactory, we've got a three month review period. It could be up to $15,000 for that total review. Um, if we have a subsequent review within a five year period, the penalty can be increased up to $10,000 per month um, at that point. Come on, I forgot the slide, hold on. There we go. Okay, plans of correction. Once a provider receives the compliance program assessment, they should identify and implement corrective actions as indicated in the assessment. OMIG expects providers to proactively implement corrective actions and failure to do so Oh, sorry, failure to do so could subject a provider to further sanctions associated with a review in the future. Um, so definitely get on board with those plans of correction, get them into place, and then you should have no, no further problems. And while we're speaking about that also, um, OMIG's uh, assessment does include recommendations for improvement when we identify um, concerns. Okay, we'll talk about some resources. The Compliance Library on OMIG's website includes the Compliance Program Guidance, the Compliance Program Requirements Frequently Asked Questions, General Compliance Guidance and Resources, Compliance-Related Laws and Regulations, and the Compliance Program Self-Assessment Form. Related questions can be sent to compliance at omig.ny.gov. We, rec we recommend that you subscribe to OMIG's listserv for information and upcoming events and announcements. You can find the listserv on OMIG's website under the Information and Resources tab in the Provider Resources section. We'll move on to some agency-wide contact information. OMIG has a main phone number and website. You can report potential fraud, waste, and abuse to OMIG's Medicaid Fraud Allegations email address or call the Medicaid Fraud Hotline. You can join OMIG's listserv on the website again and follow OMIG on X, formerly known as Twitter. You can reach OMIG via its dedicated email address. Okay. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay, so we can move on to questions and answers at this point. I think Gabe is going to join us. Yes, I am. And thank you very much, uh, Caitlin and Kathy. We're pleased that you could join us and present uh, in such a comprehensive fashion. We have a bit of time reserved uh, for questions that have come in both through the chat as well as some that preceded um, that were submitted to Bond ahead of this program. Uh, we're committed to ending this at the top of the hour, so we'll take about uh, 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more, uh, to work through a few of the questions. And as Jackson noted in his introductory remarks, those that we're unable to tackle in this forum, the OMIG is committed to responding to in writing. So please trust that anyone who has an open question, um, there will be an answer ultimately provided to you. And uh, of course, further, you can be in touch with uh, bond attorneys such as Jackson and me, if you uh, wish to explore your questions uh, through that complimentary route. But let's start, you know, one that we've gotten through the chat that I'll post to both of you, Kathy and Caitlin, uh, is about the look back period. Right now, uh, you're focused on three month intervals. The question in two parts is what happens if 
a provider has evidence of compliant activities, but they fall out of the three month window. How does the OMEG treat those? Um, is that helpful? And then another uh, component of that question is uh, whether it is the OMEG's intention to continue to have these three month reviews, or if you're going to change the aperture at some point regarding the breadth of these. Okay. Um, so there are some requirements that are, instead of being a monthly requirement, there are quarterly or annual. So for example, quarterly meetings of the compliance committee, quarterly reports to the chief executive and the governing body, <clears throat> the annual self-assessment of the compliance program itself. Um, so those things do fall sometimes outside the review period that we're looking at. Um, I would say that if for those things, if you have a regularly scheduled interval that you're doing them on, notify us of what the interval is so that we can at least consider that. Um, we are focusing on that review period though. So if you receive a notification letter for a review period of, let's say January through March this year, um, creating something now, once you've received the notification letter, isn't gonna help you pass the review during that time period. It's not like we can go back and make it effective at that point. Um, so give us what you have during the review period. Um, and again, if it's something that you did prior to the review period, you might want to tell us what your interval, of, you know, the expected interval uh, of that activity is so that we can take that into consideration. Great. And as far as, uh, sorry, yes. second part, <laughs> as far as um, going forward, what Omega expects to do, um, you know, again, there are the quarterly and annual um, activities that are required, especially those annual ones. You know, we find that they fall outside the review period often, and so we can't give them credit, but it also doesn't count against the provider. Um, there is no plan currently to expand the review periods that we're looking at um, beyond three months, um, but that doesn't mean it won't happen somewhere down the road. Okay, great. Well, thank you both. Um, a relating question, and actually ties to a comment, Kathy, that you were making in your uh, final uh, slides that you worked through. Um, it's about sanctions and penalties. And the question is whether the OMIG has issued any sanction or penalty thus far in its process of review under these enhanced standards. And if not, why? If those are coming, when might they be expected? Okay, so we assess each provider's compliance program independently. We, you know, that's just how it's done. Um, and, you know, the imposition of penalties depends on how they perform during, you know, during the review. Uh, among the um, reviews completed to date, there have been no monetary penalties imposed. Great, thank you. Um, is it fair to say that uh, your office is um, you know, taking an approach of working with the provider community to um, help to educate individuals and organizations about these changes at this moment. And that's a theme, you know, that has come up in some of the preceding instances of this webinar series. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so I'm wondering, just in connecting that um, rhetoric to this moment, does that remain the case? Are you still in education mode? I think we're always in education mode. We always have been. Um, providers can reach us on our dedicated phone number and email address. Any questions they have, um, we're willing to work with them on that. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate, when you contact us with questions or concerns, we don't record that in a way that um, would be considered, you know, that we would look at you as a subject for a review. Um, it has no connection to that process whatsoever. Um, so feel free to call us, you know, our staff will talk to you and work you through whatever questions you have. Um, again, we're out doing presentations to share as much information as we can. Uh, we have information on our website, you know, the, the guidance, the frequently asked questions, um, and we'll probably be updating those frequently asked questions as we go along um, to, to reflect some of the newer questions. Great, thank you. Um, another question concerns um, the reality that organizations uh, delivering healthcare services are often reconfiguring. A lot of that is happening right now in our post-pandemic environment for various economic reasons, um, where you'll have you know, a passive parent, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, another organization. Um, what is the expectation that the OMIC has in, in terms of the way uh, compliance should be structured? We know, of course, 
each compliance program and its effectuation is unique. But you know, when you have organizations coming together where there may be two compliance cultures coming together, how are you looking at that? How are you handling that? It would be great to hear some of your thoughts. Okay, so providers had the freedom to um, to implement their compliance program in a way that best suits them. You know, again, we take that all into consideration. Um, we've seen providers working through transitions. For example, when you have two groups coming together, they had separate compliance programs. Now they're coming together. There might be a transition period where they maybe developed a whole new compliance program for all of it, or they continue to operate two separate compliance programs. It's really up to the provider on how they want to go forward with that. Uh, we generally see that providers like to consolidate compliance program efforts into one program. So, um, you know, just communicate with us. If, if you receive a notification letter and you're in that transition phase, communicate that to us and we'll work you through that. Great, thank you. And let me pose a question that I think is, um, you know, one that Caitlin may be in best position to respond to at least initially. It's around um, contractor, or contractor, excuse me, uh, relating uh, compliance obligations. Essentially, um, Contractor is a very broad term and can mean a lot of things depending on the nature of the organization vis-a-vis -vis the folks they work with in the outside world, those they connect with in order to uh, deliver services. What is effective training for a contractor in that context, knowing that there is a matter of um, fluidity, if not subjectivity, um, across you know, the broad array of organizations that uh, certainly you're looking at? I would say that some good information to put into that training for contractors could include things like uh, contact information for the compliance officer so that if a contractor does need to make a report or even ask a question about the, co the compliance program, they have a method in which to do so. I'd say also a good idea would be to include information about risk areas in there um, so that provide the contractor has an idea of what sorts of things they might need to report to the, com the compliance officer if needed. Um, and I think, as I said earlier in the presentation, another good idea would be to put in there some sort of acknowledgement form so that the contractor can sign off saying that they've read about their the um, provider's compliance program and they understand how to adhere to it. Um, I think any information about any policies regarding risk areas that that particular contractor may interact with is also a good idea to include in that packet of training information for the contractor. Kathy, would you agree with that or would there be anything else that you would add to that? I think that was good. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Great, thank you. And you mentioned risk areas. Of course, uh, risk areas can change over time. Um, how should that be handled? Um, because of course, you know, the communication with contractors is unlikely to be daily, um, but I did hear certainly in your comments earlier that uh, your office is expecting regular communication. I'm just thinking about how one packages um, information to contractors, knowing that risk areas may shift and uh, how does OMEG um, expect organizations communicating, excuse me, with contractors to further communicate that reality of shifting risk areas and priorities? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking of an example in my head. Um, I'm thinking that uh, if the provider did some auditing and monitoring related to uh, functions being provided by the contractor and they found a compliance issue, they maybe need to work with that compliant with that contractor to correct the issue and uh, monitor it going forward. I think that would be a regular communication during that process with that contractor. Um, and, and so the contractor should be informed of what happened, what occurred, how, how you know, probably work with the provider on the plan of correction. Okay, that's helpful. And my, my question as much as anything was about the fact that one organization may have multiple contractors it's communicating with multiple contractors um, around uh, the elements of its compliance program, enunciating its risk areas per Caitlin's recommendations. But let's say in 2024, the risk areas are X, Y, Z, but in 2025, they are A, B, C, and D. Uh, I'm just mindful of that dynamic. And you know, instinct tells me that um, you know, the OMIG would uh, not only expect, but 
um, look for evidence of the materials being updated from time to time to mm -hmm. reflect changes in risk areas. Is that fair? Yes, that is. Okay. Great. Can, I, can I just add, add a point to that, Gabe? Bill Schwartz here, um, Kathy, if you don't mind, and Caitlin. Mm -hmm. You know, beyond the, the OMIG requirements, all providers, as we all know, they, they perform their own risk analysis. And, and OMIG absolutely recognizes that, that, you know, it respects that, you know, ultimately it's, we don't impose what those risks are. And we, we don't, meaning we don't suggest that every risk is 100% risk. I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do. So that's always taking into consideration. Um, but having, you, you know, uh, the good faith effort and documentation on, you know, if a certain risk area has, has you know, it's been reevaluated, that's to be expected. We just need to understand why that is. But this whole effort is about promoting compliance. That's what, getting back to your point about education. This is about pr promoting compliance, not to find out who's not doing something. Um, of course, that's important, but ideally the goal here is to promote compliance similar to self-disclosure. In a perfect world, the regs, the statutes are abundantly clear, they're easy to meet, and everyone gets it right. We know everyone's trying to get it right, and we're trying to get it right by helping understand what's going on in the field and share information so people know what we're going to be looking at. My last point will be is that's why these sessions with Bon Schenick and King and others across the state, you know, we are committed to that outreach because that's an only the only way that we can help inform, you know, the community, but also help inform us on the work that we're doing. So with that, I'll say thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, and very much appreciate those comments. Unfortunately, for the purposes of today's session, we are about out of time. So there are a number of great questions that we didn't have an opportunity to address, but we will make sure they get responded to. And let me turn this back to Jackson Soames so he can provide some closing remarks as well as uh, direction on future programming. Jackson? Thank you, Gabe. And thank you again to the OMIG and our presenters, Kathy and Caitlin. And thank you, Bill, as well, for jumping in at the end there. Um, and thank you all for attending this program. If you have any questions regarding the Part 521 regulations, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Bond. And lastly, um, we are, as Gabe noted, we are working on developing another pro program with the OMEG um, that will likely involve multiple jurisdictions perspective on compliance. So please stay tuned for that future programming. Please stay tuned for answers to any unanswered questions and as well for the slide deck to be circulated. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, everybody. Thank you again.